I'll skip introductions and uh, go, go immediately to business. So this talk will be about Cartins and Kotlin, and it will be the second installment of the talk that Andrew did uh, last year. So the key question here is how many, please raise your hands, who watched Andrew's talks last year from previous years? Like we said, great. So, I mean, happy to see lots of hands. Uh, for, for the rest of you, we'll, we'll just, I do quick recap uh, for the prototype uh, that Andrew presented last year, and the, we'll explain a little bit the workings on that prototype that we had in the Kotlin team, so what issues we found, how we solved them, and uh, uh, how it's actually turned into actual release that end user has saw. So there will be interesting parallels with many things that are designed for Java language because you know it's never like, it always changes from prototype to release. And uh, a little bit how we evolve libraries, style, and other things. Um, if we have time, we'll talk about future directions, some issues, you know, challenges that might be interested to other people who work on similar features. So let's, let's do a recap first. So uh, the, I think await the concept, it was championed by C Sharp and uh, uh, then later adopted by many other languages, JavaScript, TypeScript, Dart. Um, so the key concept there is a pair of keywords for async and await, which you mark async marks your functions, await marks your invocations. And the product vision was to eschew uh, those keywords and instead go with functions. So instead of doing async await as a hardcore keyword, uh, do them as functions, which gives you a benefit of uh, being more abstract. So for example, uh, the same language uh, construct would be able to express both async await and uh, generate yield and lots of other constructs uh, with just a few built-in things into the language. And that gives us sensibility. Uh, this lets us work on stock GVM and uh, because you know it's it's all purely local, it just compiler things. And and unless you're, I mean, you you can it's recorded talk. You can watch how it's all compiled state machines, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's pretty local thing. Uh, the key idea behind how this works uh, was that you know when we have an invocation like await something, and we invoke it, uh, for example, we're waiting for completely the future, and we want to get string as a result of that, but having waited for a completable future to complete, uh, we would declare our await function with a suspend modifier, and uh, it would we perform some magical transformation. We would add a continuation in, of the result instead of returning the result, and our result will be void, which is in Kotlin called unit. Uh, and you know, continuation is here just a generic callback. So nothing really interesting, like it's resume, resume with exception. It's, it's all pretty simple transformation. And the idea in the prototype was that if you need to implement a function like await, uh, the implementation is going to be really simple. Uh, you'll just install, for example, in completely future case, uh, you do when complete, which is a callback on completely future. And you process this callback, and if there's exception, you resume uh, with exception, and if it's, you know, value, you resume this value. And, you know, simple, beautiful, but as, you know, with many simple and beautiful ideas, it is wrong. Uh, and the problem was encountered, interestingly, and it's, it's kind of a common case. So we first encountered in the Kotlin team, and the end, even though the whole design of product was completely public, like anybody could see, encounter it, but still, you know, uh, we encountered it first before some other people, you know, submitted issues, you see here's a problem. And I'm, I'm curious, how common is that in the language design? You know, when you make things public, you ask for comments, but still, you know, issues get usually discovered by your team because, uh, because you are the ones who work on it all the time, think about it all the time, and find problems with it. So what's, what's the problem? So let's take a look at the particular, one of the particular problematic example. Uh, so let's consider this async function that repeatedly awaits for something. And what if the work returns there is, is very fast, returns completely future that's already complete, like it doesn't have to wait for anything. So what's going to happen? So we're, 
working with this uh, whole, you know, async function. Compiler had compiled a state machine, and we're inside this compiler-generated method for this state machine. So we're invoking a wait. Um, you know, a wait then invokes when complete, uncompletable future. And the way this completed future in Java implemented, actually many asynchronous constructs in Java are implemented on that way that if uh, it's already complete, it immediately synchronously invokes the callback. So we will actually right here invoke whatever lambda we pass to it, and we'll check, it. no, it's no exception, it's you know, value, and invoke continuation resume. And that resume continuation is actually implemented by, by the same you know, state machine object, which then delegates to a state machine class. And we get back inside the same code, invoke await again, and you, know, you see the pattern, it's, it's all going to end with stack overflow error. Uh, so, I mean, the worst thing about this problem is that it will, in practice, it will show like in random places in your code. Like under, it might, you know, you write some code, you know, do lots of step one, step two, step three, you know, asynchronous actions, and sometimes if it's under certain timing condition, it will stack overflow, others it's not, it will be really hard to reproduce and track back. So, I mean, definitely, we can't just release it this way. We have to find a solution. So, and solution turned out to be in like a multi-step adventure. So at first, let's address the core problem. The core problem is that when you look at the signature of suspended function in the, as they were designed in prototype, I mean, all you can do is you can evoke continuation. Basically, it's kind of designed for functions that do suspend. And there's, there's nothing you can do if you don't want to suspend. So we changed that. So instead of returning a void, we uh, started to return what's in uh, any question mark, that's Java's object, just anything. And in fact, it's just a gimmick to represent the union of the result time and a special token called current in suspend. It lets us distinguish between two cases. So if the curtain did not actually suspend, decided not to suspend, it just returns the result, it does not invoke continuation. And if curtain suspends, it returns a special token and prompt will invoke continuation later on. So it's one or the other. You are not supposed to return the result and invoke continuation. You either return the result or you uh, say, I suspended and I will invoke continuation later. With this convention in place, we can, uh, we can avoid this stack overflow stuff because if we don't want to suspend, we'll just return instead of going into yet another loop. So having changed this convention, it's just, all that remains is just to write implementation of this await. And because the protocol be becomes complex, I have to either suspend or invoke continuation. I mean, I, there is a need some consensus algorithm here because it's all multi-threaded, et cetera, et cetera. We have to coordinate multiple threads potentially here to make sure like only one thing is taken. Uh, I mean, we can expect users to write the code like this. I mean, this code is definitely correct. But again, releasing it in such a way is no go because you know, the whole vision was that it would be easy to write suspension functions like this. And is, this kind of is definitely not going to be easy. Like uh, people will be writing, definitely will be writing the simpler code and falling into the stack overflow trap. So that's kind of starts the solution. The second step is let's, instead of doing this very complicated uh, transformation where like you have to have continuation, you return some strange talk and you know, union which is not actually expressible in Kotlin's type system, neither in Java's type system, so it's just attack. Uh, let's actually hide this whole complexity. Let's uh, transform a weight into its natural signature. Remember, the way it was invoked on a call side was just passing completable future and expecting results. So let's express it in the signature. But when we compile it on JVM, let's actually perform the transformation and add this continuation parameter during compilation. So we call this CPS transformation continuation passing still transformation. But it's not a, like a simple CPS transformation where you said continuation will also have this additional convention about result to, make, to uh, allow us 
say that, no, we don't want to, we don't want to win this stack, just return result immediately. So then we have to allow people to write the code somehow. The idea was uh, borrowed from a uh, scheme. Uh, so it has a brother uh, called call CC, call with current continuation, which basically what it does is basically capture the continuation of current execution into a variable, it passes it uh, to subsequent block. So we kind of took this idea and said, okay, now if you want to write a wait and you want to, because like in declarations it now doesn't have continuation, but if you want to access it, I mean, what you do is you just uh, use this magic, sus magic suspend curtain or return function that gives you back this hidden continuation. So the whole idea is it's going to work like the convention we had before. Like, but instead of having uh, you know, both your arguments and continuation in declared, you, you declare only your actual arguments and get continuation through this special magic invocation. But how will we make this magic invocation work? So uh, the idea is this. We declare the suspend curtain or return as inline suspending function, which uh, takes, takes a block of code as parameter. The block is functional type, takes this, receives this continuation, returns our magical token, this one. And this, this function is going to be interesting in compiler. So instead of uh, hacking, comp like the column convention will just teach compiler to understand one magical function. And this magical function will get compiled actually, just like other suspending function using CPS transformation. And, but it's, so it will actually gain this hidden continuation parameter and will be able just to invoke the block with this continuation that's, that's not, but I, I cannot express this function in Kotlin code, so this is interesting because normal suspending functions don't get the continuation parameter. It appears only through compilation. So this is intrinsic, you know, it has to be implemented in the language. The other things that has to be implemented in the language is called tail call. So basically my await function makes a tail call to this new magic function. And here we have to remember that when it compiles, my await function gets uh, continuation is additional parameter. So I don't have it declared, but when I compile on GVM, my GVM signature will, will have this additional continuation. And uh, you know, because what it, the only thing it does, it makes a tail call to suspend curtain return, I will, compiler will just pass on continuation to the next call. So this way, I can uh, write some code inside, and it will actually, will disappear in compilation or just if I declared it previously. So this way we can turn the new code into the old code during compilation. That doesn't solve our problem with the complicated code that users have to write in order to make it work. And that's where abstraction helps in. So now with all those pieces in place, we can define high level function called suspend curtain, that it's, we call it, gave it a short name because it's safer to use. What it does, this suspend curtain function, it basically receives a block that's structured simpler. It returns a unit, it doesn't have this, uh, you know, suspended or not suspended token anymore. And it encapsulates the whole complexity of consensus algorithm. I, I don't have to, like it's, it's, it's now abstracted away so that I can write my await in a simple shape. I can use this high, high level suspend curtain function to write my await function on completely future and suspend curtain encapsulates all the complexities of actually making sure that I either call curtain or return, call continuation or return result. So this way the code looks simple but it, it actually works correctly. And this is the recommended pattern that we now promote to the users, like, okay, if you have a, something callback based, like completely future, some other kind of future, you can write sus suspending function uh, that works with it, like with using this simple pattern. And, you know, all the complexities are hidden inside. Questions here? Are you following me? Uh, 
So well, let's recap. So we, we had to introduce this complex convention uh, to allow to, to solve for stack overflow error, but we restored uh, fidelity between the call side, the declaration side, by hiding CPS transformation, and we've introduced call CC to recover hidden continuation that's now hidden. Uh, we've uh, taught compiler how to do tail calls, so we can code as previously, but compiled code is the same. It's, it combines with, nicely combines with Kotlin's inline functions. And uh, we can abstract away, you know, complexities of consensus and hide implementation details from end users. The final touch here is that, you know, in the original prototype, we had uh, defined a weight as, you know, as function that takes uh, completely the future as, a parameter, and in, in, in fact, what we released is we released this extension that you invoke on a completable future. So this way, the code that was originally looking like this, where you call the weight and of something, uh, would look now like this: something dot await, and it's just Kotlin style of doing things. You know, this way your code reads like fluently. You know, left to right, you start some work and then you await for its result. It's just you know, in Kotlin, most APIs are, like Kotlin is a language designed uh, to be fluent, so you can, you know, your code reads like a pros. Uh, but, so let's continue this story. Uh, this, so we've looked at the evolution of the suspended function between prototype and release, but what happened with the way you build your curtains? This is called curtains builders in Kotlin, and in prototype, you had this pretty complicated syntax to require them, uh, so that, that how your async definition have looked into the prototype. And it used a special keyword to declare the fact that async, the, the body of the async function, what's lambda that's passed to it will, will, have, will be carotene. Uh, so it was yet additional modifier. And again, magic signature transformation. Because in the code, like the block is inside, it just returns some T. But you have to hide it inside, perform complex, you know, transformation of this natural signature into this one to declare it. And you had to do some magical incantation of how to start carotene. I mean, then, you know, you can watch last year's talk with, with all the details of how it worked in prototype. Uh, the, the future controller class was supposed to be to declare it with few special operators to handle the result or exception of the carotene. So whenever carotene completes, it would either invoke handle result or controller or handle exception, and you write some code. In case of, if you wanted to return a future, you would complete your future. It's, it's, it was simple, but, but like it, it all did not feel natural. So what we noticed is that the continuation parameter that we were passing to those operators was not actually ever used, so we removed it. And now, this, the whole controller stuff has started to look conspicuous like continuation, just different names. Uh, so it's just basically something you do after your curtain finishes, you know. Uh, and, and so we did that, you know, issuing all the details. What we did is we looked at the async declaration and also noticed, like, it's now something that takes continuations parameter behind the scenes. Well, we already have this. We have this, uh, you know, CPS transformation that kind of hides continuation from end users. And so the way it evolved in the final release is that now you declare your builders like this. You write uh, that as your parameter is just a suspended lambda. It's lambda that, you know, with suspend modifier, which means it will take hidden continuation inside but your signature now looks natural. Your signature as your declaration site looks the same as you would actually use it at the call site because as a call site you would write some block of code that returns T and a sync wraps it into completable future and returns to you. So now it all looks natural. And we removed a need to have an additional, you know, no, it was not a keyword, but, but a modifier, but anyway, there's, we just have suspend now we don't have any place for curtain modifier in the language. And the way we start curtain is 
the just standard library has this method start coating that you know you give it uh, completion continuation like what to do when the coating is over and now you implemented simply your future controller or name it whatever you like uh, it is now just implements continuation as a bonus of all of that that we've kind of normalized all of the features and now we're using continuation everywhere and we're using suspending function everywhere, it became possible to write this really magical looking function. This function is at the same time a suspending function, so you can use it in a coroutine. That's that was the key idea. A sync await. So like in C sharp, you can use a wait only in a sync block. A sync block starts a coroutine and a wait can only be used in it, so suspending function can only be used in keratin. But you can also, it can also serve as a keratin builder and can take a block that's, that's yet another keratin. And because all of that works through continuation interface, I can suspend current keratin and start another inner one, passing continuation of that one as a completion of my, my inner continuation. So then, instead of writing my function more work like a sync function, and you know that returns completely future. What I can do, I can instead write it as suspending function uh, that instead of returning completely future, just returns the, the type T in, 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 in whatever my result is, string in this case. And uh, so that way I can remove a level of indirection. So it's becoming a suspending function that I can use in some other place directly. This is all became possible because we introduced this tail call, tail, tail calls. We allow one suspending function to invoke another one, and suspending is just a suspending function we can now invoke. That's great. It's look like it's, it looks really useful uh, because it allows us to do in one suspending function actually do arbitrary suspending invocation, not just tail. Just by adding this suspending function, we can now in the body of it like just invoke a wait which previously was only invocable from async functions. So what we actually did, we folded this on to compiler. So now in, in Kotlin release, you can just say, I have a suspending function that does some more work and you know, just do arbitrary invocation side of it. And compiler is smart enough to figure out, oh, you're doing non-tail invocation, then I need to create state machine and all this machinery to do suspension in arbitrary places of the function. If, if I do just tail invocation, compiler again smart enough, it says, oh, you're doing only tail suspended invocation. I don't need the state machine stuff. I can just pass on continuation directly. So it becomes all, becomes all hidden inside. And this gets us to a very interesting discussion. It gets us to a discussion of stateless coroutine versus stackful coroutines. So if on the last year's talk you saw like table like this one, uh, which is basically gives uh, con contrasts stackful coroutines and stackless coroutines. And you know, stackless coroutines are like C sharp, Scala, Kotlin, where you can uh, do suspension in very limited context. And stackful coroutines are like Quasar, Java flow that you can suspend anywhere. But let's do an actual comparison. What's, what you can do in Kotlin, what can you, you can do in Quasar? Uh, in Kotlin, you can suspend anywhere in a function that is marked with suspend modifier. And in Quasar, you can also suspend anywhere as long as it's marked with either throw suspend exception or suspendable, marked as suspendable annotation. So in both cases, I mean, you have to mark functions where you can suspend. So does it mean that now Kotlin, after all these changes, now belongs uh, to the same group as Quasar, JavaFlow, et cetera? So does it mean uh, the Kotlin now has stackful coroutines? Or does it mean that actually it's not like Kotlin, Quasar, et cetera, it's all stackless because you have to specially mark, and the only true coroutines that are truly stackful are in languages like Lisp, where you can do call CC anywhere, or like Go, where everything runs inside coroutines, and any function can suspend your execution and get switched to another coroutine. I mean, it's hard to answer, and I would actually claim that it's false dichotomy. Like, the whole this division of uh, stackless, stateful, it's, it's, it's pretty, 
useless in practice. Uh, because, I mean, it, it's even unclear where to put like Kotlin or Quasar in what bucket, uh, stackless or stackful. You can argue this way, you can argue the other way. What I would say is the only useful distinction that different carotene implementations have is distinction between async and suspended functions. So let me go in a little bit more detail on that. What's, what's the difference between async function and suspended functions? Async functions is the functions that return some kind of a future. It may be called a waitable, uh, you know, task, something different languages promise, called different way. But conceptually, async function, you know, uh, returns some wrapper of the result that you will use to wait. And suspended functions, they just return a result, but they suspend execution until the result is available. And the key thing is that in Kotlin you have a choice. You can write your function in the first way, in a sync way, or you can write them another way, in a suspended way. And you have this interest, for example, with Quasar. So that puts both Kotlin and Quasar into the same bucket, whenever you call it. But for example, if you look at other languages like the historically adopted c sharp approach, like Dart, uh, you know, JavaScript, they don't have this choice. Like, the only way to use coroutines there is to write a sync function. That's the only thing you can do. There's no facilities to provide suspended functions. Uh, and like C Sharp uh, working proposal to include coroutines, oh, sorry, C++ working prototype to include, uh, to, uh, include coroutines is also this, the same form. I mean, all you can do is to define your uh, functions to return some kind of a wrapper. So why it's important? I would actually now argue that it's so important that you have to name your async functions in a special way. So I would say that every async function ha should have somehow get reflected in the name. Why? Because there is one big problem with async. Uh, when you have an async function, that you can just invoke it and it's valid invocation. It starts your operation and immediately returns you a future that you can use later. But the operation works in the background concurrently with your invocation. Or you can start it and wait for it. And you know, in languages like C Sharp, that kind of looks like a single clause, await some operation. In Kotlin, it's just method invocation. And that produces the actual result, waits and produces result. So the first usage is concurrent and asynchronous behavior. Your program continues while the other work happening in the background. And the second usage is sequential. I do something like, like a normal code. There's something, I wait for it, I continue, like regular code. And in practice, where you write some kind of any complex business logic, the second one is what you need. Like, like, you, like every programmer, they, they were taught to think sequentially. Do this, do that, if this, do that. And sequential defense should be default. Like throwing concurrence in developers, it's just, just, you know, just risky, it's, it's error prone. You forgot to wait on your async function and you have concurrence out of thin air where you didn't want it to have it. So Kotlin suspending functions imitate sequential behavior by default. That's the idea, but by default, it should be sequential. You should, ha you should be opting in into concurrence and not getting it by default. And so that's why I would claim that that's a really important distinction that you can write suspended function in Kotlin, which are sequential, unlike like JavaScript, where all you have to do is a sync function and concurrency is being thrown at you. But that's, that's just starting our story. So now let's talk about composability of all those concepts. So now we have builders. And I can define the builder that returns completable future. I can return Guava's listenable future. I can return my own future, my awaitable task. I can define, you know, suspending function. I can define a wait extension on completable future, on listenable future, on my own future, anything else. And what I actually want, I want them to compose together. I want to be able to use some third party library methods that return some crazy future, wait for it inside my sync block that wraps it into future that I'm using in my project, or just use it from suspending function that, and does not, do not wrap it into any function. We you need to compose all of that. And in Proto, we were struggling with this composability. 
uh, and the decision was to make all suspended function composable by default. So we removed our restriction on composability and we made a synchronous use case, a default one. Because in a synchronous world, it doesn't really matter. I mean, what suspending function you invoke and what kind of result you produce. They can compose, nothing prevents them from composing. And we allow to define some suspending function anywhere. There's no restriction anymore that they have to be inside controller or anything like this, a anything. But there, is, there are synchronous cases, like generate yield. And these are synchronous coroutines because when you generate a sequence, you want to resume uh, and produce next element with yield uh, in, in the moments of time that you control. Uh, when you invoke next, you want coroutine to resume, work until n n another yield. And this synchronous use case it has to be restricted. I can't just do arbitrary suspension inside of such coroutine. So, so we made an opt-in behavior for that. So we, uh, there is a special restricts suspension annotation in Kotlin that lets you define synchronous coroutines. We won't go into details, but I mean, the, the key takeaway there that we made a synchronous use case default because that's the world we're living. I mean, lots of people need those. Like, like that, that's what a sync await has op opened their, their road to. So the last piece of the composability puzzle that we've introduced is coroutine context. So in the prototype, there was this vision that you can create UI bound coroutines, that you can invoke some async UI function and it will force everything in its body to, do, to work in UI thread. How easy, because uh, like in prototype, a weight was defined in the scope of async UI and when uh, invoking resume on a continuation, it would first dispatch it to UI thread. So all the code you write is in UI thread. So this way you can await for some async operation and update your UI and don't worry about thread switch or anything like that. That was a vision in the prototype. Uh, but the problem is that, of course, it's a special character builder and uh, a special suspended function in scope. And we have a, the same again composability problem. Are we going to define it for every kind of future all again, all these builders, it's, it, it's, it's hard. So the way it evolved, instead we've agreed that every builder we define will be taking a context as a parameter. It's kind of a convention, basically. All our libraries that build coroutines take this context as parameter, so you can specify what you want, what, what threading behavior you want. Uh, and this context has capacity to intercept continuation. So when you can resume, uh, it, it, gets, it gets passed through the context, the context can, can, can decide whether it wants to, to dispatch it to its own thread or not, like it's up to the implementation. Because of that, we had to a little bit expand our original continuation interface from the prototype, so we've added context to the continuation. That's why whenever Curtin works, it always has a completion continuation, we look up all the information out of there. Uh, the cool thing about it that suspending function like it doesn't have to be aware about that because all this interception is actually hidden into language support runtime. So you write away the same way as before. Like the await code I've shown you for completable future is the actual code, it just works. But in UI context, it will get dispatched to UI thread. Uh, and I can have, for different UI frameworks, I can have different UI contexts, and they will all dispatch appropriately. So the other question we faced when working with a prototype, and again, if you look the, uh, the presentation last year, there was an open question it, uh, with a prototype. What about, what to do with threat safety? Because you know, uh, coroutines are, this, are the, those thread hoping things. Like, you can write this code. You can create a list and it will work in one thread. Then you do some suspended function, like a wait, and it will suspend you. And after a while, we'll resume the same code, but it may happen in a different thread. And uh, in another thread now, you can manipulate your list. Do we have a data race here? Or do we need the question, do we need volatile writer reads when we spill uh, our state to a state machine and we reload it to make sure that it's all correctly synchronized? 
the, the answer is result in no. There, is, there are actually no data races here because uh, await, whatever implementation await does, whatever think await does, is establishing happens before relationship. If you look documentation of, say, when complete of a complete of future, it explicitly says that there is a happens before between you know, the, the completion of the future and whatever happens since Lambda, and it's true about every other synchronization construct that we have in Java and GVM. So, so we don't have to do any extra work. Like await, whatever await does, will ensure that happens before it's there. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that simple, and now I'm coming like, you know, open uh, questions part. There are still some challenges with, with the way it's implemented. Uh, and I will just name a few, I mean, the most interesting challenges for this particular group. So, I mean, uh, people who, who might be implementing uh, some, some things like that. So, one interesting thing is how threats and cartoons interact. For example, you can write this code, this pretty legal code. Uh, you can wrap suspending invocation into a synchronized section. And what happens actually, that my torrent will happen in one thread, and my interaction can happen in another thread because it can resume another thread. What you get? You get a legal minor state exception, of course. You know? And if it w would have been easy if it happens only with my enter, my enter exit, but it's not just it. It also happens with re-entered locks, they will also throw exception if that happens. If you switch the thread, you can't lock in one thread and unlock in the other one. It also happens with thread locals. And it also happens with, uh, you know, with like things like that rely on current thread. So I rely that I'm still the same thread. There's some libraries that use thread current thread and do something about it, but you know, after a while, I'm, I may still be in the other thread. So, so remember that, you know, we're doing what's, I think we're doing completely local. We're not patching GVM. We're not modifying uh, using unsafe to hack into thread local class. So we cannot transparently migrate thread locals with us. Uh, so we're kind of, we're taking really safe path. So for example, like the Quasar, Quasar kind of takes a bolder path. It actually hacks, you know, thread locals, you know, reads them through unsafe, migrates them to another threads when, when it does that. We don't. So we have to provide something for our users, and so that's where current in context uh, works for us. So current in context actually is not just for interceptors, it's a generic map of a current in local elements that user can define, and this kind of thread local replacement for us. So this way, uh, if you want to hack thread locals, you can do it. You can, you can install your own interceptor that would, you know, whatever th context is switch will hack and migrate thread locals to another thread, but we just don't provide this kind of behavior out of the box in the standard library because we're playing safe. Uh, we're not uh, touching any, uh, you know, hidden APIs or anything like that. The other challenge that we have are stack traces and exceptions. So let's take uh, this code. So we have suspending function will work that it invokes other suspended function work. And that one awaits for something and gets suspended. After a while, it will get resumed. And when it gets resumed, you know, remember, when you resume, you invoke uh, resume function. And the state machine in the work function implements this resume function. So the state machine option of the work function is what provides that implementation. So what now happens if I resume? My stack would contain this resume invocation and I'm back to work. So now if I throw an exception, that's what I'm got, that's what I'm getting in my GVM stack. But the user thinks that he is in a function more work that hasn't worked work. So there is mismatch now between the stack that GVM sees and that gets thrown an exception, and what user thinks and wants wherein. And this is, by the way, difference between how Coroutine is implemented, for example, in Kotlin Quasar, because Quasar restores actually the whole stack when it resumes, so it's less of a problem. We, we took a little bit, I can say, faster approach, so we lazy restore stack. We don't roll it. So if you're suspending deep invocation, we quickly resume without restoring the whole stack. But what we have 
this mismatch problem, and it's really hard to patch. The like exception classes in Java, in GVM, they don't provide you lots of freedom to manipulate. You're kind of stuck, uh, and it, it's a hard problem to solve. Like, you know, we would have loved some features that would let us more customizable approach to stack traces so we can patch our vision of the stack onto the exceptions that are getting thrown. And again, remember that we're doing local transformation. We don't want to patch everybody's code. Like, our transformation is purely local to the suspending functions uh, that there are. So what else? The libraries has also evolved. Uh, over time, since the time of the product, we wrote a lot of library support for coroutines. You know, language support is really small. All we have is the language is suspending keyword, some compiler things, and you know, this start coroutine, suspend coroutine stuff. That's it. A little bit in the language itself. Everything else is the library. So we do have a bunch of you know, communication primitives, like uh, our own futures. We were forced to have a different name for them because like, the, the word future is abused everywhere in GVM. Like you have listenable, completable, simple future. So we looked at the Wikipedia. Oh, deferred, the synonym for future and promise. Let's use it. So we also defined the mutex. Again, we can't use lock, which Java tool concurrent, because that one blocks a thread. And we wanted something similar, but that suspends a carotene. So we have a mutex with a suspending function log that would suspend a carotene until, until it's available. We also implemented you know, channels, uh, the classical ones from uh, CPS uh, you know, uh, with you know, synchronous rendezvous, buffer channels, all these abstractions that, say, people uh, in some other languages are, are used to, like especially concurrent languages. Like languages for concurrent program usually have lots of that like built into the language or it's a library. So we implemented all this primitive as a library. We also provided a bunch of carotene builders. So I think is, is what we started with, but it doesn't, turns out not to be the most useful one. The most useful is actually ability just to write suspended functions or just, for example, launch carotene and forget about it. You don't want the, any future as a result. You just want to launch and forget about it. Sometimes you also need to integration, like you want to block a thread, like your main function, while the carotene is working, so that's a run blocking for it. We also have lightweight actor facility, integration with lots of reactive libraries like Rx, different versions, Project Reactor, all of that. It's, it's all a library part of it. Uh, we also provide like the general selection facility so we can wait, like receive on multiple channels simultaneously, delay, you know, do timeout, do suspendable neo, all this stuff. It's, it's becoming just a library. And the good thing about it, you, you don't, like it's really clean. It's not like a wait some delay or um, you just call delay. And it's a suspending function that delays your current. You don't have to wait something, some special future that would fire in certain milliseconds. You just say what you, like your code reads like, like what you want to do, like a prose. Again, you just see what's going to happen. Um, there are some work in progress things that we're still working on on the library side. We're, we're working on civilization of the carotene and migration of them. Uh, you can do it now. A few people have already hacked in using, uh, using, you know, refl using reflection or some other libraries, but we're, we want to build it like a more supported thing so you can serialize them. Uh, we're also working on migrating this in other Kotlin backends, JavaScript and native. I mean, we have language support there. Like both Kotlin native and Kotlin JavaScript, they support on a language level, carotenes, but the libraries are missing. Like all these actors, you know, channels are still have to be ported. Uh, we're also looking to support all the pipelining stuff, so you can get channel, filter it, map it, to basically support all the data flow programming kind of thing. So you can program with data flows, expressing your data flows with a concise code. Also working on a IO library with byte channels and stuff that would be actually suspending. So which instead of installing a handler, you just say, I want to read and we'll suspend until the bytes are there. It's it's right now we have a prototype, it's backed by by Netty. And uh, you know, we have a project Cater IO, that's a server side framework. Uh, that's heavily relies on carotene. Because of we have carotene support, we can express the flow of your server-side application with a simple code. No callbacks, no callback kill. You just write what you want to do. I want to do this, this, go, 
uh, OAuth here, there, it's all like step-by-step -step code, which in fact is completely asynchronous code when it gets compiled. A closing note on terminology uh, that's, that's avoided uh, having listened to talks. In Kotlin, we don't use the term fiber, strand, green thread. We just avoid it. For us, the carotene is enough. And if you actually open Wikipedia on a fiber, it says, you know, carotene is basically the same concept. So we decided that we don't want too many th concepts to confuse our users. So we just use the term carotene. Carotene for us is a lightweight thread. Is a synonym for fiber, a synonym for, for everything else. This makes it simpler, just less terms to, for end user to remember. So let's wrap up. I mean, I'm, we're out of time now. Uh, in Kotlin, coroutines are experimental. What does it mean? It means that because the design is new, like it's not unlike like every other mainstream language, it's not unlike uh, we don't have a weight I think keywords that everybody seems to love these days. I mean, it's, it's a completely new design. Uh, and there are good reasons. So we wanted people to try it for real, and there is a limitation of what you can do while you're playing it for yourself. So we actually released it as, on a public with an opt-in switch. So it's experimental. You can opt-in into using cartoons. But we still guarantee backwards compatibility because it's a released feature, you know, we guarantee that your code that you compile with quarantines now will continue to work tomorrow because we want people to try it for real and get us feedback on how it works. Uh, we, the, the, we reserve the right to break forward compatibility. So it means that uh, we may add things so that the new code won't work with all runtime. Run That's the only difference between experimental feature and the normal feature. Like for normal features, we support both ways compatibility, especially for minor updates of the compiler. And some later points we'll have to finalize design. There's, again, still open issue with threads, some other implementation details that we'll have to iron out, and at some point we'll finalize, but anyway, the old code will still support, will still be supported, will provide some kind of support library when the design is finalized. That's it. 